Before The Last Dance, the highest rated ESPN documentary was a documentary about legendary football and baseball star Bo Jackson, which attracted 3.6 million US viewers. But when The Last Dance premiered in April this year, it shattered that record. Its first episode attracted 6.1 million US viewers, and the numbers held strong in subsequent episodes too. Clearly, there was an appetite for this series. At a time when there was no live sport being televised, and most people were quarantined at home, getting antsy or bored out of their brains, the last dance was appointment viewing, pure water cooler television, bringing together people of all ages, from all walks of life, all over the globe. I had friends who never gave two hoots about basketball tuning in and wanting to talk about what they'd seen. And yet even without the pandemic, The Last Dance was always going to put up big numbers. It promised hours of exclusive never before seen footage and the chance to reminisce about the 90s with some of basketball's most familiar faces. More than that, it gave viewers the opportunity to hear the man of the 90s, Michael Jordan, give a director's commentary on his career an instant sell, and a winning play. But it almost all never happened. For almost two decades, Jordan refused to release the footage, which was only shot under the condition that it would never air without his permission. So for almost two decades, all that footage just sat there on the shelf doing nothing. People came to Jordan with pitch after pitch after pitch, but it was only in 2016, some 18 years after the footage was originally shot, that he finally gave the green light on a proposal that would eventually become The Last Dance. Even then, Jordan made sure he was in the driver's seat. An agreement was made which stipulated that he would be able to respond to anything that was said by the other 105 people interviewed for the series. He would have the ultimate home court advantage the last word on every claim, every story, every person. One example of this takes place in episode four, in which Jordan's longtime rival, Detroit Pistons guard Isaiah Thomas, explains why he and his teammates once controversially walked off the court without shaking the bull's hands. Jordan is then handed an iPad to watch the footage of Thomas's explanation, which he then proceeds to dismantle and dismiss as rubbish. Similarly, in a later episode, Seattle Supersonics guard Gary Payton describes defending Jordan in the 96 finals and how he was able to slow Jordan down. Once again, Jordan is shown the footage on an iPad to which he simply laughs and says, I had no problem with Gary Payton. I had a lot of other things on my mind. Now, some people have criticized this aspect of The Last Dance, claiming that it compromises the journalistic integrity of the series if one person gets to have the last word on everything. Uh, one analyst has even said the series is more of a documercial than a documentary. And yeah, I get it. There are certain things about Jordan that were minimized or omitted by the series, and we are given his perspective on things more than anyone else's. But at the same time, it wasn't a total beat up either. It still delved into areas of Jordan's life that he would have found uncomfortable, his dad's death and his gambling addiction for starters, to the point where he himself admitted he was concerned that people would think he was a horrible person after watching the series. Jordan was worried about how the last dance would affect the way people thought of him. And fair enough. I mean, we're talking about a guy who, when he retired from the NBA, was without a doubt the greatest player the world had ever seen. We're talking about a guy who was held up as this inspirational figure, a national hero, a cultural icon, a real-life superhero. And because, unlike other former players, he's kept pretty quiet since his retirement, that reputation has remained relatively intact. In other words, giving the green light to the last dance was a risky move for Michael Jordan. He had very little to gain and everything to lose. So can you blame him for wanting to have some level of control over how he would be portrayed? With all of that on the line, who wouldn't want the last word on their own career? Wouldn't you? I know that I would. Here's a fun thought experiment. If someone were to make a 10-part documentary on your life, what would you want included in it? 
What events would you want to be discussed? What events would you want to be left out? What events would you want to have the last word on? Now, for most of us here, the answer to those questions will only ever be a fun thought experiment. Chances are most of us here won't have a 10-part documentary made about our lives. But that doesn't stop us from trying to control our own image, does it? It doesn't stop us from curating our photos and videos on the internet. It doesn't stop us from arm wrestling conversations into opportunities for self-promotion or impression management. It doesn't stop us from drawing attention to the things about ourselves that we're proud of, whilst hiding away the things about ourselves that we're ashamed of. It doesn't stop us from spending countless hours worrying what others really think of us, paralyzed by the thought. You see, deep down, we all care about what others think of us. And the problem is that as good as you might be at getting others to see you in a certain light, there are always going to be those moments when someone or something exposes you for who you really are. You get tagged in that unflattering photo or cornered in that awkward conversation. Someone starts a rumor about you or digs up your internet history. For Jordan, that came in the form of backlash from ex-teammates like Horace Grant claiming that much of what he said in The Last Dance was BS. It came in the form of an audio recording contradicting Jordan's claim that he had nothing to do with keeping Isaiah Thomas off the dream team. You see, we think we can control our own image and how others think of us. But every now and then, someone comes along or something happens to remind us that we can't. And even if it's been a while since you've had one of those reminders, even if right now it feels as though you've managed to fool everyone else, the Bible reminds us that you can't fool God because he sees everything. The New Testament book of Hebrews says that nothing in all creation is hidden from God's sight. Everything is uncovered and laid bare before the eyes of him to whom we must give account. According to the Bible, we don't get to have the last word on our lives. That privilege is reserved for the Almighty, our Creator, God. Everything is uncovered and laid bare before him, the good, the bad and the ugly, our proudest moments and our most shameful secrets, the deepest, darkest motivations of our hearts and the competing desires within. God sees it all. And depending on your relationship with him, this could be either terrifying or a source of comfort. See, for some of you, the way you relate to God will make the idea that he sees everything a threatening one, an idea that makes you angry or afraid. You feel violated, like your privacy has been invaded. And at this point, you might even want to dismiss the whole idea as rubbish. But not because you don't think it's possible. And not because you don't think it could be true. But because deep down, you don't want it to be true. You don't want God to see everything, and you definitely don't want him to have the last word. But you know what? God seeing everything doesn't have to be as scary as you think. Because God doesn't use his knowledge of you to embarrass you in front of others or anything like that. The Bible says over and over again that God not only knows every detail of our lives, but that he also provides forgiveness for the things that we're ashamed of and for the times that we've ignored him. And that forgiveness is ultimate because it covers all our mistakes, not just the ones others have found out about. And that forgiveness is true because the penalty for our rejection of him was paid by Jesus on the cross. And that's why for some of you, God seeing everything is a great relief and something precious to hold on to. You feel safe. You feel cared for knowing there's someone watching over you who knows exactly what you're going through. Someone you don't have to explain yourself to. Someone you don't have to create an image for. But someone whose love for you is so complete, you'll gladly give them the last word on your life. When the credits rolled on the final episode of The Last Dance, I collapsed back into my couch and let out a deep breath. It was a wild ride. It was a compelling series, an awesome series and a great chance to reconnect with some of my favorite childhood heroes. But at the same time, as I watched Michael Jordan tell his story, I couldn't help but notice that the series showed no matter how rich you are, no matter how powerful you are, no matter how successful you are, 
You can't control your own image. And there are no guarantees you'll get the last word. Now, for some of us, this will be an endless source of frustration. But for others of us, it's a huge relief that we don't have to curate, that we don't have to parade or perform or fight for the last word. Because we know that the one who will have the last word, the last word on our life, is not against us. He is for us. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you that because of Jesus and the forgiveness that he offers, we don't have to be afraid of the fact that you see everything. And so wherever we're at with you today, please grow our knowledge and love of Jesus. Please help us to rest in the reality that with you, we don't have to pretend. We don't have to work hard at managing an image, hiding away the things that we're ashamed of. Because it is you that will have the last word on our lives. And in Jesus, you have shown that you are for us. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.